for the debate. I recognize the member from Sudbury. Speaker. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, we're all here today because Premier Ford and his government have decided to make things worse for Ontario. Well, let's quickly review what happened. March 31st, OPG and the Power Workers Union collective agreement expired. And then that summer, they got their first contract offered. It was rejected by the membership. And then the, uh, somewhere near the end of November, beginning of December, they had their second contract offer, and that was rejected by the membership. And then December 13th, basically a week ago today, they had their third contract offer, the final offer. I'm going to explain what a final offer is later on, but that was also rejected by the membership. So the final offer is a term used in Labor Relations Act, and, and Section 42 allows the, the employer to force a vote of the membership. Otherwise, the vote comes through the, the negotiating committee, and they typically do this because they feel like the membership will, will accept the offer. They can only do it one time, and it's called the final offer. And I'm not sure why OPG chose to do this, because from the press releases, the three offers were essentially the same. The other two were voted down, and this third offer was voted down by nearly 60% of their membership, 59.8%. Now that's important, 60% voting it down, because on Tuesday the Premier said, I don't stand with union bosses, I stand for the little guy, the frontline workers. Well, the frontline workers are the membership that voted on this offer, and they voted it down three times, Speaker, by large majorities. So on Friday, December 14th, the power workers gave notice of a strike, and that's important, the notice of a strike, it's not a strike. That puts pressure on both parties. Basically, what it says is there's a deadline. In this case, it's 21 days. Other, other cases, it's different, but it's a deadline. Let's put our heads together. Let's get things done, because in 21 days, we're going to walk off the job. And it appears that the Ministry of Energy, Northern Development Mines, and the Ministry of Labor understood this, because on Thursday, they released a joint statement. And the joint statement said, we strongly urge both parties to reach resolution before this leads to any power interruption. So let's, let's negotiate. Let's work together. And what changed? Well, on Friday at noon, the Premier announced he's going to legislate the Power Workers Union members back to work. That's what changed. And that's important because in Canada, the right to collective bargaining is a constitutional right. In the past in Canada, it was illegal. You actually get beat up and put in jail. But workers now have a right to bargain collectively. They have a right to strike. And those rights are protected by the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. That's important. And it, the Supreme Court of Canada ruled they're protected by the Constitution. So. When they made the ruling, Justice Abella said this, the right to strike is essential in evening the playing field between workers and employers. Attributing equivalence between the power of employees and employers ignores the fundamental power imbalance. Now, the other day I was watching Saturday Live reruns and Phil Hartman was on doing Frankenstein's Monster and every time they would go to speak to him on the news, <laughs> Frankenstein Monster would just go, Fire! Bad! And that reminded me of this government speaker because the government, every time you hear unions, the response is, Order. Unions bad! <laughs> I want to tell you a little story about union speaker. It, it, it's, it's timely because it's a Christmas story. It's about Edgar Burton. Edgar was a steel worker from Sudbury. He's passed on. But in 1987, back then, his, his children were going to St. David's, which, which is where I grew up, actually, in that riding in the Donovan. Uh, so anyways, the, the kids come home one day and they say, Dad, why are some kids not, why are some people not having enough food to eat? And he looks in these big, you know, big childlike eyes and what can you do as a father, right? He, let's Order. try to collect some cans. So he works with the union, he works with the steel workers, he works with the company. Back then it was Inco, it's Valet now. And together they negotiate and they start up the business employee Christmas food drive. And they have this one wooden box and they place it at div shops where Edgar works. And they collect some food, a couple cans and put them together. And after that year, his daughters go, let's do it again. And so as a father, he's, like, he's going to do it again. And he came up with a slogan called one more can than last year. So if he can just collect one more, he's going to be happy. So Edgar died in 2010, but this has been growing over the last 31 years. And it's grown to include the support of more than 250 local businesses, multiple unions, and the entire Rainbow District School Board, which enlists the teachers, the students, everybody to get involved. And the food drive was renamed the Edgar Burton Christmas Food Drive. And it wrapped up yesterday in Sudbury. The Sudbury Star ran an article I was reading this morning. I want to share some of it here. The Edgar Burton Christmas Food Drive is expected to collect more than 100 tons of food again this year. The annual campaign has collected more than 1,000 tons of food since it first began. 
Today, Valet, which was Inco in the past, donates the time of one full-time, one part-time steelworker for about two months to organize the, Christmas, the Edgar Burton Christmas food drive. Local 6500 is proud to continue Edgar Burton's vision, said Nicola Rochelle, who is the president of those steelworkers. We'd like to thank our members, Owen Marcotte and Jeff Lalonde from Valley's Divisional Shops and all the volunteers for their work on this year's campaign. The Sudbury Food Bank provides food to about 11,000 people every month, and of those clients, more than half are children. No. Collection of all the donations during the Edgar Burton Christmas food drive is no easy feat. In fact, the campaign organizers call on the Army to get the job done. The 2nd Battalion Irish, Irish Regiment of Canada has participated in this event for many years, and it's a great source of pride for the unit, said Sergeant Scott Barb. It's kids helping kids, it's neighbours helping neighbours, it's coming together as a community to make sure no one goes hungry this holiday season, said our Mayor Brian Bigger. And the reason I raise that... The reason I raise that is an example of that unions aren't bad. Unions are good and they have fundamental rights. In fact, the Ministry of Labour should know that the entire Occupational Health and Safety Act was formed because of steelworkers in Elliott Lake. Yeah. I also think that people need to know that workers, unionized or not, workers don't want to go without money. Workers don't want to be on strike. Yeah. I know this firsthand because I've been on strike twice. I was on strike for three months in 2002. I was on strike for a year, a year while this, these governments, the Liberals and Conservatives, sat on their hands, by the way, for a year. Workers don't want to be on strike, and there's a false perception that workers like to go long periods without pay, that they want to lose their house, that they enjoy the stress it creates on their family and friends. They strike and they vote down contracts because they think there's something fundamentally wrong with them. And also, management doesn't want to strike, and that's reflective when we go back to OPG and the Power Workers Union, because they haven't had a labour stoppage in 33 years. So realistically, they could have negotiated a fair collective agreement if the Premier didn't get involved. Yeah. That's right. Instead of helping the parties reach an agreement, the Premier made sure that the deal wouldn't be reached. The government basically ensured that good faith bargaining would stop. They sent a message, intentional or not, they sent a message to the employer, you don't need to negotiate because I've got my thumb on the scale. And the government doesn't like to talk about that, and that's why they choose to talk about blackouts by Christmas. Maybe Christmas next year, but this Christmas, no. <laughs> there they go again, Speaker, choosing to scare people. I'm not going to be blackouts by Christmas, and the government knows it. I see them smiling. <laughs> Let's review. This isn't a strike. It's a 21-day strike notice. <laughs> Negotiations would have likely resumed if the Sorry. Premier didn't announce back to work before the ink was dry on that 21-day notice. That's right. That's right. Now, we're going to do our job as the official opposition. We're going to debate the legislation. And no surprise, we're not going to vote for it. And I'll be proud to be the first to stand not to vote for it. And none of us are going to be surprised when the legislation passes today, on Thursday. And the government knows this. They know the legislation is going to pass today. They know that the strike notice extends two weeks beyond today. They know there's no crisis. This government knows that not even one tiny little Christmas light is going to go out. But they talk like it's a Tom Clancy novel. I would love to see the movie that they're promoting, Speaker. <laughs> It's this 40-hour crisis. I can picture the, the deep voice in a world where the light is going out at Christmas. It's not. <laughs> Order. Speaker, I, I have to tell you, instead of Christmas bells, all I've heard this week is the ringing of non-stop false alarm by this government. <laughs> here, here. And it's important to point out, Speaker, this isn't accidental. This is deliberate. The fear-mongering they're doing is a distraction. This is an attempt to change the channel from the Premier trampling on the Ontario Power Workers' constitutional rights. Absolutely. So every time you hear the minister stand up, and he loves to say time and time again, that this is less about rights and more about lights, yes. I want you to remind yourself that lights were never in danger. Never. Not even a little bit. But our constitutional rights absolutely were, and the government knew the whole time, and they kept trying to change the channel. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you.